Ladies and gentlemen, the Family Caregiver Alliance would like to welcome you to our Caregiver Assessment Webinar. My name is Ken Mullay, and I'll be acting as your facilitator today. I would like to introduce Adrena Harrison, our Information Program Specialist. Adrena, go ahead, please. Thank you, Ken. I'll just add my welcome to yours. I'm so delighted that so many of you were able to attend this first of two webinars on caregiver assessments that we're planning to present this summer. Family Caregiver Alliance has worked for over 30 years to help improve the quality of life for family caregivers through direct services, research, public awareness, and advocacy. With our colleagues at Arch National Respite Network, we jointly operate technical assistance centers to support the aging and respite networks. To better serve older adults and their caregivers, the centers provide access to practical tools and multimedia. We maintain two websites with national databases of respite and model caregiver support programs, as well as materials. We also write policy updates, sponsor specialized trainings, and provide individualized technical support. Our technical centers are funded by the U.S. Administration for Community Living which is represented today by our program officer, Greg Link. Greg? Thank you, Adrena, and I'd like to extend my welcome to everyone listening in on this webinar today. Uh, as many of you know, for more than 10 years now, the Aging Network has been implementing the National Family Caregiver Support Program and has made great strides in being able to serve family caregivers um, caring for individuals with, with a broad range of, of needs and disabilities. And one of the things that the Aging Network has clearly understood and recognized in, these, in the years that they've been developing the program is the need to understand where caregivers are in their caregiving career and what their needs are in terms of supportive services to keep them on the job and providing care for as long as possible. And one of those ways is to effectively assess caregivers. And so I'm really pleased that part of the TA technical assistance that Family Caregiver Alliance can provide to the network is this excellent webinar on what is available in terms of family caregiver assessments and how we should be doing them. So um, I thank you for, for your attention and hopefully um, you'll walk away with some great ideas for implementing and, and using caregiver assessments in your areas. Now I'll send it back over to Ken. Thanks. Thank you so much, Greg. And now let me introduce the speakers that you're going to be hearing from. We have two experts for you today. Dr. Carol Whitlatch is Assistant Director of the Margaret Blankner Research Institute of the Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging in Cleveland, Ohio. Carol has been PI or co-PI on a variety of federal and foundation grants examining family caregiver interventions, health care choice, and decision making in families with chronic conditions and dementia, and autonomy and functioning in diverse caregiving families. Carol is Associate Editor of Dementia, the International Journal of Social Research and Practice, and is on the editorial boards of Generations and Aging and Mental Health. You'll also be hearing from Christina Irving. Christina is a family consultant with the Bay Area Caregiver Resource Center in San Francisco, California. She's been with Family Caregiver Alliance for six years, conducting in-home caregiver assessments, teaching classes, and making presentations on topics such as understanding dementia and self-care. Christina also provides individual supportive counseling to family caregivers. We're going to hear first from Carol Whitlatch. So Carol, let me turn things over to you. Thank you, Ken. It's so nice to be here this afternoon. I want to thank everyone for attending. I hope we can answer all your questions, but let me get started. We have a lot to cover today. First, I'd like to just recognize that I'm sure we have quite a broad variety of experience, interest in the panel and our crowd today. So I just want to make sure everyone understands I'm going to be talking a little bit about very basic issues, and then I'm going to get to some much more complex issues about assessment. Um, just to acknowledge that I will be following all sorts of different paths, and I hope everyone, as I said, gets their questions answered and comes out of this knowing a lot more about family assessment. Let me just start with this introduction. Um, as we all know, families provide a majority of care and support to the millions of adults who need assistance. So throughout our country, there are millions and millions of adults who need assistance. And just broadly, I, when I talk about adults in need of assistance, I mean all types of assistance, hands-on care, et cetera, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Secondly, just to introduce the next idea that there are an estimated 44 million in 2003 versus now almost 50 million caregivers, family caregivers in our country today. That's a huge increase over the last few years, and those numbers are only going to increase further, as I'm sure everyone understands, with the aging of our population, improved medical 
techniques for, for diagnosing different illnesses. So family caregivers is a steadily growing group of people who will be needing a lot of assistance. Number three, we all know that caregivers have multiple needs, various needs, and very serious needs, most of them um, in the medical or, or psychological realm, but they have a lot of things that they need help with, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Lastly, assessment and care planning is very fundamental to meeting the needs of these family caregivers. So what I'm hoping to do is to talk about assessment and how that can be linked to care planning and how we can help then meet the needs of family caregivers. Again, if you have questions, I hope you're writing them down so that we can get to those quickly. Um, but I'm looking forward to hearing questions people might have. So the objectives today, then, I'll be describing critical issues relevant to assessing and meeting the needs of family caregivers. And I just want to, right now, just define what I mean by a family caregiver. And I want to be very broad in that definition. Family, very broadly defined, friends and family. Sometimes a neighbor could be a caregiver. But anyway, we're trying to meet these needs of these various caregivers throughout our country. Um, I'm also going to be describing the processes and products that are essential to successful caregiver assessment, talk a little bit about the techniques and strategies for conducting assessments, and then uh, as a result creating an effective care plan, one that really does meet their needs and has the effect of improving outcomes for these families. And then I'll end with a little bit about the future direction of caregiver assessment. Now, as we've, we've heard from Ken, um, we'll also be hearing from Christina Irving, who is in the field, the voice of the field. We'll be talking a little bit about some of her experiences as a family consultant at Family Caregiver Alliance. Okay, let's talk a little bit about who are family caregivers and what do they do. Basically, again, broadly defined relatives or friends who provide assistance or support to an adult with a chronic or disabling physical or cognitive condition. So here, the definition of care depends on, often, what reimbursement you might be working with. Some reimbursement sources are a little more restrictive in how you would define family caregiver, um, but for this purposes of our presentation today, I'm going to take a very, very broad approach. I will be talking also um, in ways that will also refer to families who have grandparents as caregivers to younger family members. Um, so we'll talk not specifically about that, but most of what we'll be talking about today will also apply to this group of people. Uh, next, they provide emotional, financial, physical, and hands-on support to these millions of adults and children in our country. Emotional support in the, in the way of uh, just helping their care recipients. Financially, they can help their recipients. They provide physical assistance. There's also a lot of hands-on support with activities of daily living, instrumental support, et cetera. Now, I also just want to define what I mean by care recipient today. Um, there are other languages that people use, but I mean the person who is receiving care. This is not to say that this relationship is not reciprocal. I don't at all mean to infer that they are just the recipient. They're often giving back a lot to their families and to their caregiver. But that's just the word for today that I'd like to use just for ease. Other language you might see in different uh, situations might be consumer, client, Another a care recipient could be a person with dementia, a person with a chronic illness. So again, I just want to make sure we all understand what we're saying. And just for ease of, of reference today, I'll be referring to these consumers as care recipients. I also just want to briefly touch on this issue of self-identification as a caregiver can be problematic. For those of us in the helping realm, we often can see someone and we think, oh yes, in my, in my world, this is a caregiver. This person is providing a lot of help to a family member or friend or neighbor. So I consider them a caregiver. Here's the services I might want to think about linking them to. But caregivers themselves often, not always, but often don't self-identify as a caregiver. And what I mean by that is just to give you a couple of case examples. Uh, working with families over the years, we've had different ways of trying to get families involved in our research as well as assessment. So you might have someone who we ask, how long have you been a caregiver? And one person has said to me, or actually more than one, has said, well, I'm not his caregiver. I am his wife. I, we take care of each other. It's very reciprocal. I'm not really a caregiver. So in her words, in her mind, she is not really a caregiver. She's her, uh, the, the partner of her husband who's taking care of him. On the other extreme of this is a family member who we asked years ago, how long have you been taking care of your relative? And this woman said, since the day we were married. So in her mind, she had been a caregiver for a very long time. 
um, maybe not in the same way that we're thinking about it for today's terms, but in a way that makes it so that in her mind she's definitely a caregiver who's been doing this for a long time. I also want to just touch on the idea when I talk about assessment that can be differentially defined by different reimbursement sources as well. But really what we're going to be talking about today is assessing the needs of these family members who are providing care, assessing them in a variety of ways, and we'll talk about that in a second. And sometimes the word assessment is not very friendly, and many caregivers who see them being assessed might see it as a test of their abilities or a test of other things that are going on in their lives. So for our terms, again, for today, I just want to use the word assessment, recognizing that others might find that word a little too formal, not very friendly, but just for today, we'll talk about in those terms. Okay, let's move now to why should we assess family caregivers? Many reasons. They play a critical role in our health and long-term care systems. I think we all know how many millions, well, we don't know exactly, but we know that there are millions of dollars that are saved by families providing care in the home. And so it's very important that we assess these families because not only do they want to continue to provide care, care recipients typically prefer to be cared by family members as well. So they do play a very critical role in the delivery of long-term care in our, in, our, in our country. Secondly, they are a very vulnerable group. They're very at risk for multiple and serious physical and mental health conditions. And by this I mean many, there's a growing body of literature that shows that for caregivers, they often have higher rates of, of comorbid chronic conditions. We've also seen a little bit of literature that talks about increased mortality rates for family caregivers. We also know fairly clearly that they are more depressed, they're more anxious than their family members and friends who are not providing care to someone. They often miss doctor visits. They don't take care of themselves as well. So they're a very vulnerable group, and there are many things we can do to help with these vulnerabilities and help reverse some of the negative outcomes. And third, it's important for us to determine if this family member is able or if they're willing to assume care responsibilities. Some people just aren't able to provide care for their relatives as much as they'd like to. And secondly, the care recipient we want to make sure is willing to accept care. Again, we, may, we come into many situations where people just aren't willing to be the care recipient. And so there are things that we can do to work around that. So that's some of the reasons, and to continue with more reasons why we feel it's important to assess family caregivers. A well-designed assessment, as I write, should lead to a very targeted care plan that can prove outcomes for the caregiver and the care recipient. We'll talk a little bit about how to design an assessment, and I will talk later about assessments that are currently being used and some that are in the works so that people can get an idea of what might be a good assessment they could somehow adapt. It's also important to assess family caregivers to help them gain access to very appropriate services and to provide follow-up in the form of possibly reassessment to support and tailor their needs for their changing needs, excuse me. So not just to start off the assessment, but to follow up with a client to make sure that they really are getting their needs met. It's also important to support the caregiver's choice to continue to provide care in the home and also in other settings. Again, most people prefer to stay at home or in the community setting. But caregiving doesn't just end when someone's living in a nursing home or when they move to assisted living or to some kind of a care home. There's still a lot of family caregiving going on in those settings, and so we're here to try to help them continue that job that they're doing with their relatives. So again, um, it's really important to assess them for these very important reasons. I want to just refer the audience to make sure that they know about Family Caregiver Alliance's Caregivers Count to Toolkit. Um, if, if anyone's able to get onto that at some point, I think you'd find that very useful to giving you more information about why we should assess family caregivers. And just briefly, it's under the family caregiver, familycaregiver.org, so it's caregiver.org, and then you go to the fact sheets and publications, and from that, there's no pull-down menu, but you go into that section to the column for other FDA publications. And I'll bring this up again so you don't have to worry about writing this down. Toolkits and training materials for practitioners. And right from there, you can get to the Caregivers Count 2 Toolkit, which provides excellent step-by-step -step guidance for the importance of assessment, gives some examples that I'll refer to later. Okay? Very good. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the myths um, before we get to the process. Excuse me. I just want to talk a little bit about some of the myths that people have and ideas that maybe it isn't important to relate to a family caregiver assessment or have a design of one. 
Some people think that it might take too long. It really would take too long to provide a good assessment of a family member, and I think we would argue that it really doesn't have to take too long. But if there are time restrictions, there are things that can be done to remedy that. Also, that it might, some people might feel that it's just too, too um, involved and too invasive to talk to a family caregiver about their needs. And again, I think we would argue that that's not the case if it's well written and if the assessment is conducted in a way that's very uh, keen on making sure someone's needs and um, private issues are dealt with in a very sensitive manner. Um, so I think it's important to realize that there are good ways to assess and, and we'll be touching upon that through this afternoon. Okay, so let's start with the process about uh, caregiver assessment. It's important to collect information about the care situation so that we can identify the specific challenges and needs and resources and strengths. It's important to keep all those things in mind. And when I talk about challenges, one of the challenges the caregiver might be experiencing is the idea of should my relative still be driving? That's a very important issue for many families that we're all looking to help. Should my relative be driving? So we can help if that's an issue the caregiver might be having, something we can do to help them. As far as needs, they might have needs as far as they need help with lifting. They might need time away from being a caregiver just so they can recuperate and refresh themselves. The resources they may have available to them might be financial. They could be more material. They could be family-centered resources. They might have family members who live nearby who could help. And they could also have their own spiritual resources. So these are all the things that we need to tap into on the assessment. And fourth, it's really important, and this is where I think we see the greatest need for further measures of assessment, assessing caregivers, is we really need to tap into their strengths. Caregivers have many strengths that sometimes we don't really focus on too well. Instead, we focus on all the negative consequences but there are many strengths that these caregivers have, and we can do our best to recognize these strengths. For example, a strength of having a sense of personal gain by being a good caregiver in their mind, or being competent that they're giving their relative the best care possible. So it's important to tap into that as well. It's also important for an assessment to follow some type of conceptual framework that can really help provide structure and direction for the types of questions to be asked. And by that I mean, a conceptual framework that takes into consideration all different types of caregiving needs and domains that I'll get into in a few, a few minutes. Next, the structure and loca location of the assessment might vary. Assessments can be in the home and therefore face-to-face. -face. They could be by telephone. They might be self-administered. They may increasingly be through electronic media. We don't have examples of that today, but I do see that coming up more as a way to assess clients. It could be a structured interview, very, very structured, meaning specific questions with specific answer categories versus a more informal type of conversation that may get to that information, but not in a way that is quite so um, regimented, but more of a conversation. I think Christine will talk a little bit about that in her presentation. It also could be t uh, taking place at home or versus another private setting. So all these different types of issues are really important in how a assessment is developed and how it is later produced. I'll continue on with, uh, more on the process. The family-centered perspective is really important, that it captures the needs and preferences of both the caregiver and care recipient. Let me talk a moment, I, this is not on the slide, but I just want to talk a moment to talk about fraud abuse, financial abuse as well as physical neglect and exploitation. That may not be an intrinsic reason for an assessment, but oftentimes it's important to take a moment with your client to talk a little bit about that. And that hap happens to capture the needs of the caregiver and the care recipient in that way. So there are different ways to do this, but most important just to be sure not to be shy about talking about these important issues. Uh, next, it should be multidimensional, very culturally sensitive. I know Christine is going to talk about that. And again, the context very, is very important too. If you're assessing someone in their home and talking about home care issues, it's very different than when you're assessing someone who may be taking care of someone in assisted living where a lot of their needs are already met. Another contextual important issue to think about is whether this is an assessment that will be conducted for research purposes or for evaluation purposes. And then third, for practice purposes. Research would be a different type of assessment, might have to be much more structured with a few open-ended questions. And a practice assessment might be much more tied to key outcomes or evaluating the program that may be in place. 
those are a little different in how you might want to design your assessments. Um, I want to talk now about the seven domains that we see are very important for assessing. And I'm drawing again upon this toolkit that I mentioned again in the Family Caregiver Alliance website. And there are seven domains that we've found are very important to assess. Let me just talk about them briefly and I'll come back to them again. These seven domains are relative to context. Talk a little bit about that in a second. The caregiver's perception of their relative's health and functional status. The caregiver's values and their preferences for care. The well-being of the caregiver is another domain that should be assessed within the instrument. Consequences of caregiving, this is a big issue and we'll talk more about that. Six of the caregiver's skills, abilities, and knowledge to provide care. Again, there's some big gaps in measures that are available for this. And seventh are caregiver resources, again, drawing upon those strengths that I mentioned a few minutes ago. So those are the seven dimensions. Just to give you taste, we'll get back to those in a few minutes. A third very important issue is that assessment staff must be well trained to understand the caregiving process and its benefits and consequences. Um, more is written in the Family Caregiver Alliance toolkit about this, but essentially assessment staff must understand what's going on for caregivers. And that's not always something that comes from training in the academic setting. That often comes from the experience of watching others and doing their own assessments. But it's very important that assessment staff understand the caregiving process and also understand that people are there because they do want to care provide, provide care. And they may have some very negative consequences from that, but they still want to continue on with that. So assessment staff must be sensitive to these various needs of families and how to perform an assessment. And then lastly, the purpose of the assessment must be clear. You as a practitioner may understand why you're there, but often caregivers really don't. They may think you're there to, at the worst case scenario, might be there to see if you think that they are good caregivers, that you are there actually assessing their ability, and that can be very upsetting to a caregiver. So make sure that you identify what is the purpose. Is it to identify the caregivers in the situation? Sometimes families have more than one person taking care of a relative. Sometimes it's important for us to see if there's a primary, as we call it, caregiver, someone who is mainly involved or will be involved in most of the care of this person, either now or in the future. Sometimes that is what the assessment is there to do, really to identify that person. Sometimes assessments for determining program eligibility. Are they available, are they eligible for services under a certain program? Or maybe their care recipient is eligible for services for that caregiver, or services that might be able to help the caregiver. Assessment might be there for care planning options, or to see if there's a change in the caregiver's or the care recipient's status or situation. So really, I just want to really emphasize the importance of making it clear to that caregiver why you're there, what will happen as a result of the assessment, so that they're not feeling in any way um, pit, uh, picked out as being an inappropriate or providing care poorly. We want to avoid that at all costs. And then next, some more issues about process. It's important to assess the care recipient's eligibility to receive services, I touched on that, that might support the caregiver. A variety of states have in-home supportive service programs, and those programs can help care recipients get very important services. And as well, they might have services that they're eligible for that help the caregiver. In-home care for the care recipient might be very helpful to that caregiver. So it's important to kind of keep a broad perspective and keep in mind the different pockets of money that might be able to help the caregiver indirectly as well. Next, measures that are used in the assessment must have good psychometric properties. And what I mean by that are they measures that have been used in a variety of settings, research or evaluation. Do they have good ability to really answer what or look for what you're looking for. Are you assessing what you think you're assessing? Hopefully you find a good measure of depression. We'll talk more about some good measures that can be used and I'll give you some references for that. But make sure you're, you're really assessing what you're thinking you're wanting to assess and that therefore as a result will make a good care plan. And lastly, there really is no need to invent the wheel. There are many programs that have good assessments and there's a lot of places that you can use to at least start your search for a good assessment or measures. Next, a little bit on the difference between screening and reassessment. So screening does not equal assessment. Screenings are much briefer. They often identify at-risk caregivers. They assess readiness. And by readiness, I mean that time that a caregiver is ready to receive services. In the many applications of assessment, we've seen caregivers who really just aren't ready. 
meaning that they don't really acknowledge the need for services yet, but what we try to do is get in there early on to identify them and help them get a little bit of service at the beginning rather than waiting for the very last minute when services become more of a crisis need. So that's the assessing of the readiness of that caregiver. It also should occur before or at least in conjunction with an assessment. So there may be a screening that identifies at-risk caregivers once they are deemed at risk and they move on to the full assessment. Sometimes they don't. But the best part of the screening is to have it available so that it can be used with a larger assessment that probably taps into larger unmet needs. Similarly, assessment does not equal reassessment. You can assess somebody and often the initial assessment followed, which follows the initial screening is often a larger type of under, under ta task to undergo rather than the reassessment, which might be a little briefer. A periodic reassessment is strongly recommended so that you can really check in on the person to make sure that they are either following the care plan that they've agreed on or they might need a little help with that. It might be just a quick phone call with a few targeted questions and there are examples of that that we'll look at. It might just be there to identify changes in the care situation, meaning maybe the caregiver themselves has their own issues that need to be addressed separate from the issues of the care recipient. And lastly, the questions of the screening and the reassessment must, re must align with the purpose and goals of the screening. Um, I'm sorry, the questions must align with the goals of the screening assessment and reassessment. So the questions must be consistent with what you're looking for in care planning. Okay, let's talk a little bit more in depth about those seven domains that are important to assess. First, we're talking about context. These are questions that help you understand the caregiver's context that they're living, the background questions, some demographics, questions about what is their relationship to the care recipient. Are they married? Um, do they live together? Do they live at home? Do they live in an apartment? What is the strength or quality of the relationships they might have with other family members? How long have they been a caregiver, et cetera? So these are all questions that are important to establish what the context is. They're also often very useful and important for eligibility criteria as well. But for this part, I just want to talk about, I want to speak about the context so that you can understand it better. Um, many people who come into assessment have sometimes preconceived ideas about what the care situation is like. But with a structured interview, you can definitely get to more, um, to more specific areas about their, about their context. Second is the caregiver's perception of the care recipient's health and functional status. So there we're asking caregivers, how is their relative doing as far as their cognition? How are they doing as far as their personal care needs or managing finances? Even using the telephone, psychosocial needs as well. Have their family interactions changed? These questions get to the caregiver's perception, not the care recipient's perception, but the caregiver's perception. We're working with that because that's the perception that we're going to have an impact on. Another part of this is their perception of medical tests and procedures. This is an area that has very few measures. We've been working to establish um, a compendium of measures for assessment. We found very few measures of this. So this is an area that we are looking to find more measures. Third, the caregiver's values and their preferences. And these can be things about who they think they would like to have help out, who they think their relative might like to help them out, culturally based norms that might be important to look at as well as their preferences for scheduling and delivery of services. So it's important to look at what the caregiver values as well as what they prefer for their relatives' care planning. Fourth is caregiver well-being. This is health. These are health conditions, depression, emotional distress, life satisfaction, quality of life, really anything that has an impact on the caregiver's well-being. For example, how often in the past six months have you had a medical exam would be a good question to ask caregivers. Many of them will say it's been much more than six months, so I have no idea when the last time I was in it to see a doctor. They, they, they often take care of their needs after the needs of their care recipient. We don't want that, so we want to make sure that we tap into it and have an assessment of their well-being. Fifth is the consequences and rewards, as I mentioned a little bit brief, brief, uh, brief, briefly, looking at some of the challenges they may have, work strain, some of the financial strain, maybe relationships in their family or friends. They might have had difficulty getting informal providers into the home. Is there a social network that the caregiver can have, can have supplemented somehow? And then also the rewards, satisfaction of helping their family members. It's important to tap into these benefits and rewards because those are what often keeps the caregiver going through difficult times. 
Number six is the caregiver's skills and ability to provide needed care. Now here I'm not talking about assessing a caregiver to see if they are competent. Um, I'm really here to talk about what are their abilities and knowledge. And I'll talk a little bit this, about this when we quickly talk about the care plan. If a caregiver doesn't understand the medical situation of their care recipient, they're going to have a hard time responding to it and finding services that are appropriate. So that's very important to make sure that they have at least knowledge about the diagnosis and the prognosis. And seventh, again, resources available to the caregiver are very important. What is their helping network that's available? What are their coping strategies? What are their financial resources? What are the caregiver, how do they cope in difficult situations? And so as an assess, with an assessment, you can get to those resources and find ways to help them enhance those resources, again, to improve their outcomes. So those are the seven domains that are very important to include. I bet many of you in the audience are saying, well, how can we have all of this in one assessment? It's going to take seven hours to do this. And you're right, it would take seven hours to do it. But hopefully you'll be able to target a few of the important context, uh, excuse me, domains for your assessment and be choosy about the questions you ask that you are able to do it in a time, timely manner. Okay, next products. The product of a good assessment, should that be a care plan, the development of a care plan that clearly outlines eligibility, options for services, et cetera. This may seem like a difficult task, and in some assessments there, are some very few actually have algorithms, but after you've given all this information in, it almost fits out the type of a care plan that you might be able to just take to the caregiver. More often though, an assessment has no such algorithm, and instead we look at what the needs, what the person is complaining about, and we figure out what type of services they can be linked to. So the care plan outlines options for service, potential eligibility, and informed support, also provides ways of maintaining optimal health. It also sets up a way to, to look at future goals, preferably realistic goals that everyone can agree to, including the care recipient. Next, service and support must be consumer-directed and family-focused. But on the other hand as well, the services must be available. So if you have an unmet need for a caregiver but no service to meet that need, it's something to think about. It's often hard to work with the care caregiver um, and making expectations for them or giving them expectations that all their needs will be met. The reality of it is there are very few areas that have services of all types. There are, of course, more geographic locations that have more rich service networks and that's always good to work with, but often not the case in our more rural or frontier settings. So making sure that the services are available is an important part of the post-assessment process. They should be consumer-directed, as I said, meaning that they are focused on what the consumer wants, and they're also family-focused. They take care of the context of the family and the family caregiver. The goal is to have outcomes to be clearly measured in order to determine change. Is there change in self-care as a result of the care plan? Is mental health and physical health improving? Or maybe not improving, but just stabilized? Oftentimes we get into this rut of thinking, we have to see all this improvement in our families that we're working with. Well, sometimes improvement, well, improvement is typically good. I don't mean to say it's not. But oftentimes just prevention, maintaining a level of health is what we're looking for. And that's a good outcome. So don't, don't think that having mental health stay the same when it was pretty good to start is a bad thing. You want to, again, really want to emphasize the importance of maintenance of a good level of, of a health, physical health, and self-care. And lastly, caregiver assessment and support are critical to ensuring the positive outcomes for the care recipient, too. I know we're talking a lot about, I'm talking a lot about caregivers, and many of us in the field have uh, clients who are the person with the chronic illness. And by having a caregiver assessment and support that's working to help with caregiver outcomes, there's just almost ample evidence to show that the care recipient will benefit as well. Okay, what are some more of the techniques and strategies for conducting assessments? Let's talk a little bit about barriers. Barriers are very important to talk about. And one of the first barriers are challenges to assessment. I already talked about and I don't really list here. Um, well, I'm sorry. The, the, the reimbursement, excuse me, reimbursement is inconsistent. I talked briefly about that. So depending on where you live, different types of reimbursement strategies are available to family caregivers to be assessed. 
So if it's inconsistent and you need to figure out a better way to have reimbursement, then that's a difficult and very challenging barrier to assessing a family caregiver. Um, similarly, government and other third-party payers don't always reimburse for caregiver assessment, so that makes it very challenging. So that means often a very small assessment within maybe a larger functional assessment to the care recipient. Currently, we have very, the, the workforce that is trained to understand the needs of the family caregivers is, is, is very minimal at this point. Not a lot of academic settings or trainings or certificates really talk about family caregivers as the targeted client. So there's not a lot of people who really have this type of experience. And so little by little, they have to work with caregivers to get that experience. Um, fourth, as I said earlier, the caregiver does not always self-identify as caregiver. So that's a huge assessment challenge or barrier to assessment. Confidentiality is another very important one. And by that, I mean there are many situations or reimbursement types of situations where if the care recipient is the client and they refuse to give release information about their family caregiver, then it's unethical and actually illegal to talk to that caregiver. So that's a difficult barrier to get around. There really is no way to get around that. Again, if the care recipient refuses to release the contact information of that caregiver. So that's a very big challenge and not one that's easily remedied. Another challenge is once we do have an assessment started, it's difficult sometimes to balance the best interest of the caregiver with the best interest of the care recipient. And what I mean by that is it might be in the best interest of that caregiver to have some time away from the care recipient. Time away meaning maybe they step out of the house for a couple hours, maybe bigger, maybe they take a small or bigger vacation just so they can kind of rejuvenate themselves. And sometimes that might be difficult for the care recipient. Families often use assisted living or other types of pre-types of permanent types of settings so that care recipient can be in a very safe environment while the caregiver is gone. And while that may not hurt the care recipient Physically, it might be okay for them, but they might have a hard time adjusting to those few days. So again, balancing the best interest of the caregiver with what's best for the care recipient, and sometimes there has to be a little give and take on that. And sometimes families have a hard time recognizing that, but it's important for that caregiver to get their health taken care of. Okay, what I'd like to do now is turn things over to Christina Irving, our voice from the field. Christina will be talking about some strategies that she has used over the years. She's going to be talking a little bit about some issues of cultural diversity, and I'll turn it over to Christina. Great. Thank you, Carol. As Carol mentioned and, and Ken before, I am a family consultant at Family Caregiver Alliance. We are the Bay Area Caregiver Resource Center, so we are one of 11 caregiver resource centers in California. And as family consultants, our role really is to go out and do assessments for family caregivers, as well as to provide ongoing support, education, training, counseling, all those types of services. So most of the family consultants are either a master's in social work like my Myself, licensed clinical social workers, masters in gerontology, or marriage and family therapists. So we have the clinical background as well as getting additional training and experience with caregiver issues. Um, we also use the term family consultants because we are not case managers. We are not providing um, intensive case management services. We are really helping empower the caregivers to navigate through the long-term care and health services um, systems. We're empowering them to be their own case managers, and we're providing ongoing support and consultation as needed. So obviously for caregivers, the situations change over time, new needs come up, um, different problems or concerns, and this way we're able to kind of work with them as time goes on. For us, the caregiver really is our client. Um, in the past, I've worked at the VA with hospice patients and will include families and caregivers in our services and, and in working with them, um, but the patient is really the client of record. And for us, the family caregiver is our client. Um, so it's not just about making them a better caregiver, but supporting them as an individual. So it's their experiences and their perceptions of the situation that really drives our care plan. Um, again, not just about how do we help them better care for their, their loved one, although that is something we talk about, but also what do they need for themselves in terms of support. So we do assessments, and ideally we do home visits. 
Um, it's really great to see families in their living environment. You get a better picture of their situation, what their needs are. Um, it just gives you a more well-rounded picture. That's not always possible even for us. Sometimes we do it by phone. This can be if the person lives farther away or if just schedules aren't permitting us to get out there in in a reasonable time frame. Um, we have also done assessments in a caregiver's workplace if they're still working full time. We've also done them in coffee shops and cafes and that usually comes up when they're uncomfortable doing the assessment in front of their care recipient. Um, if they're taking care of someone who's in early stages of dementia and they may not feel comfortable saying these are the challenges, these are the things that stress me out when that person is sitting in, in the room or in the next room. So we'll sometimes do it um, out of the home or even in our office as well. We have an assessment form. You know, as Carol mentioned, there's lots of them out there. Um, we do have an assessment form that we use and we fill out during the assessment and, and afterwards. We also have a depression screen that we'll have the caregivers fill out just to get a sense of any depression, anything we need to address in terms of their own mental health and mood. We also use a narrative progress note. So in our client record system, our computer system, we'll write a narrative note that just gives more detail from the assessment. So we'll get into more detail about how the client's doing, things that we want to expand, expand on a little bit um, from the assessment form. So our assessment form has a lot of structured questions and that really drives the conversation that we have and that's usually how I view it when I go in. Is It's about a conversation but I know that there's this information on the assessment that I want to get to the domains that Carol mentioned earlier, um, what type of help the care recipient is needing, help with ADLs or IADLs, looking at the caregiver's health and their mood, what types of resources and services are available or what type of support do they already have in place. So we talk about all those things. It's in our assessment form and that's where the more training that people have in doing assessments, the easier it is to get that information without feeling like you're having to go down a checklist. Um, Following our assessment, we do what we call a caregiver action plan. So this is our care plan. It highlights these are the problems or needs that came up during the assessment. This is the goal and these are the action steps. Um, so for example, it may be the caregiver saying that they need to get more breaks and more help so that they have time for themselves. So the goal might be to have time to see your friends, go to the doctor and get some time off to relax and reduce your stress. And so it, the action steps may involve that information about hiring in-home help, how to use or how to access an adult day program, how to get other family members and friends involved, and if there's any other respite services available in the community. So we send that out following the assessment and then we do a follow-up call about a month later just to see how things are working. Were they having trouble accessing services? Um, were there any problems, any challenges, what's working, what's not working? As Carol mentioned, reassessments are great. We've done reassessments um, in the past at six months and at the one year mark. Our reassessment forms are a variation of our assessment forms. So it's a lot of the same questions but much shorter. So we don't re-ask every single question from the assessment but ones that we feel are key and areas where there frequently are changes. We really want to ask what's different, what's new. Um, or if there are problems that are still existing, why is that and what can we do to help resolve some of those problems and some of those issues. Um, following the reassessment, we will continue to do six-month check-in calls and those are really just a check-in. How are things going? What are you needing? Our ability to do reassessments and check-in calls definitely has been reduced over the last few years of state budget cuts. So the question of you know, reimbursement and what are the challenges, that's definitely one that we faced in California um, with the state budget. So we've had to adapt that a little bit, but the idea of still being able to check in with caregivers over time is really important. We also encourage them to call anytime. You know, we let them know we may not be able to call you as much as we would like, but we are always here to answer your calls. We've had clients that have been open for you know, even up to 10 years because we know that these caregiving journeys are not short. They can last a very long time. We most often close clients when the care recipient has died. 
um, that's probably the most common reason for closing someone. We will occasionally close clients if they have placed their family member. Um, that's not a given. We know that the caregivers still have a lot of work to do. There's still a huge role for them um, and a lot of challenges that come up even if the care recipient's in a care home. But sometimes people are feeling really comfortable with it um, and, and they're not really in need of other services. Again, we leave it open that they're welcome to call us again in the future but we may go ahead and close it so that we're not initiating those follow-up calls. But again, a lot of it is really driven by the client and by the caregiver where they're needing help. The San Francisco Bay Area is a very diverse area, so we work with clients from a lot of different cultural backgrounds, a lot of different ethnicities and races. So we have had to adapt our assessments to be appropriate to each family caregiver that we're working with. So our assessment tool may stay the same, but our process of doing the assessment may vary. One example, I work a lot with a number of Afghani clients over in the East Bay in San Francisco. Um, concepts of privacy, burden, those are historically not been part of their cultural norms. Generations have lived together in the same home, so caregiving has just naturally occurred. So when we talk about you know, privacy burden, are you feeling stressed out by taking care of someone, those are not concepts that are really common. And so we often have to be sensitive to that, word things in a different way, approach those conversations in a different way than we might with somebody else. There are also a lot of differences, though, generational differences for the younger clients in the Afghani community how long they've lived in the U.S. and kind of acculturation issues. So it's really important to be aware of that. That also can come up if you're using an interpreter from the community. Oftentimes, having somebody from their community can make them more comfortable. Here's someone who understands where I'm coming from, somebody who gets it. And that can make it easier for them to talk about their situation. Um, they may be more comfortable with that. But also, when there are sensitive issues like the sense of burden or stress, they may feel more uncomfortable acknowledging those feelings or addressing that when it's somebody from their community who is there. Um, so it's just important to be aware of that, that these issues that are part of the assessment, the questions that we ask, you often have to adapt it and kind of feel it out based on the caregiver. Sometimes you can get to those issues, but it may not be in that initial assessment. It may be something that you have to bring up in future phone calls and either the check-in call after the the caregiver action plan goes out, or in the reassessment as you get to know the person. Definitely certain topics like placement or end-of-life issues can be very taboo in a lot of different cultures. And even when it's not a cultural issue, it just can be very hard for people to talk about sometimes. So again, there's a sensitivity to, to discussing those issues. Um, and oftentimes, you just have to be less direct about it. So how can we get to this information that we know is important, but without making the person uncomfortable. Obviously, San Francisco, we have a large LGBT population, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and so it's really important in the assessment, especially if there's any of the forms that the caregiver is filling out themselves, that the language is inclusive, that we're not just saying spouse, but it's partner, that we're acknowledging that there's going to be different legal issues when you're working with LGBT caregivers, different limitations to the ability to access public benefits, and their experience of accessing services is going to be very different, either because of a history of discrimination or fear of discrimination. Um, a lot of older caregivers and older care recipients who may have been out in the past as they age sometimes are not as comfortable disclosing to people that they um, are LGBT. So it's important to have that awareness to make it as safe of the space as possible. And these are areas where having that clinical background can be helpful. It's figuring out how do you work with this client based on who they are and where they're coming from. We have our assessment tool translated into both Spanish and Chinese because we've had staff who have been able to speak those languages and so able to do those assessments in those languages. That may or may not always be possible for people. And so again, sometimes we're using interpreters when we need to do home visits and assessments in other languages. So it's important to make sure that those interpreters are trained in how to interpret and not just fluent in the language. Partly because there's a lot of terms that come up in doing caregiver assessments, things around health, um, around dementia, and those may not be 
commonly understood words, even for someone who's fluent in another language. And again, also making sure that they're able to interpret that they're not infusing their own belief systems into, into the assessment and into the questions that they ask. Literacy level is also important. Again, if they're filling out forms, but also in the caregiver action plan and any follow-up resources that we send out. What's the literacy level of your clients that you're working with so you can make sure that the information you give them is easily accessible to them. Our assessments are really driven and focused on the caregiver, which again, that's who our client is. Sometimes their goals may be a little different than ours. We often get calls from caregivers wanting to know how do I hire in-home help or how do I get financial assistance? And that's what drives them to ask for an assessment and to ask for services. But our assessment covers a lot of the different domains that Carol mentioned earlier. And so there's other things that we want to talk about and bring up. So it's finding that balance, making sure that we get their needs met, but also that we do a broader assessment so we can make sure that there's if there's any other issues or other areas that they might be able to get more support or more help, that we're able to address those as well. The assessment process really can be an intervention in and of itself, not just a means to an end for the caregiver action plan and for the follow-up resources. It's a chance for the caregivers to talk, to be able to vent, to be able to tell us what's going on. It often is a first time that a caregiver um, has really had somebody ask about how they're doing. How's their health? How's their mood? What are they needing? What's their experience? Um, a chance for them to acknowledge that sometimes they do get frustrated and angry and upset um, with the person that they're caring for and that those can be very uncomfortable things to talk about. And so it's a great opportunity for them to be able to share those issues that they're experiencing and to really feel heard and validated. Um, we also do a lot of education during the assessment process. If they're bringing up that the challenges are around getting mom to take a shower because she has dementia, we'll talk about that. So there's a little bit of education that goes on during the assessment process. It's not just about us gathering information, but about being able to share and educate as well. So just the process of doing an assessment can actually be very powerful for the caregivers. Um, and I know the next webinar later this summer will focus more on practice issues as well. Um, and again, feel free to write questions. So with that, I'm going to turn this back over to Carol right now to get into some other issues. Great. Thank you so much, Christina, your voice of experience, and thank you for sharing all of your great experience with the caregivers over the years you've worked with. Really helpful, so thank you. Um, okay, I will move on now to techniques and strategies for conducting assessments. And um, while I'm getting to the next slide, I just want to refer you again to the Family Caregiver Alliance caregiver.org website. I'll be talking about these assessment instruments from these states and a few other things. And again, it's under the toolkit. So caregiver.org, under fact sheets and publications, go to other FCA publications, toolkits, training materials for practitioners, and there you'll see caregivers count two, step-by-step -step guide. And right now we're going to be looking at section four, wrapping up the toolkit issues and looking at examples of caregiving assessment tools. So first we're going to talk about Massachusetts for a moment. So for Massachusetts, we have um, seen them develop a 50-page care recipient assessment done with the care recipient under their real choice functional needs assessment. And within that larger assessment for the care recipient, there's a section H that talks about unpaid support. Caregiver status leads to another type of field that you would fill out. The module asking a care receiver about their caregiver. So in this Massachusetts assessment, there's no real section for asking the caregiver, but the care recipient is asked questions about the caregiver and then could refer the uh, worker to the uh, caregiver themselves. But Massachusetts then has a 50-page assessment. Um, next, Washington, the state of Washington, has a, a lovely short one-page, what they call their care tool. It assesses the burden and barriers to continuing caregiving. So more, it's, it's not exactly a screening, but it's not as in-depth, but it actually does speak to the caregiver. So that's a very important measure that you can look through. The third is the American Medical Association has put out a very nice screening page, uh, double-sided, 18 questions. It's self-administered by a caregiver. Again, it's a screening, and it's 
18 questions ask caregivers a little bit about their situation and talks with them, uh, doesn't talk with them, excuse me, it has them then speak to their physician if they find that they've scored a, a certain level. If certain questions are answered a certain way, the caregiver is suggested to talk to their physician about getting some assistance. If they talk about a certain level of stress in a couple of questions, or if they've been very ill or unhealthy over the past few months, uh, or have a certain sc summary score, then again, they are listed resources on the back of this, and they can also, they're also suggested to talk to their physician about getting some assistance. Next is the California Caregiver Resource Center's assessment tool. Again, these all can be found on the Family Caregiver Alliance caregiver.org website. This is a five-page five page document. The one on the website shows an earlier version of this, which uh, was, ex was an excellent version of well. Uh, this assessment taps, as Christina said, nearly all the domains that we spoke of earlier, the seven domains there. Strengths can be noted here. There's places for that. And the earlier version, which is a 12-page version, uh, led nicely to a care plan, as does the current, more, a little bit more abridged version, the five-page version. What you'll see online is the Bay Area Caregiver Resource Center tool, but again, it's a nice tool that's easily uh, used in a variety of settings. Um, I also referenced a few times the Caregiver's Toolkit, excellent step-by-step -step directions for how to assess, what to assess, all sorts of things. We've referenced a little bit about that today. As well, but not listed on the overhead, is one by Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has created a very nice, as well, it's a 42-page, um, but many of the three of the pages, the 42-page uh, 42-page document as asked of the care recipient. About three pages or so ask about the caregiver directly. So it's an excellent reference as well, and it shows how a caregiver assessment can be nested within a larger, a larger assessment. Uh, and this one, they ask uh, who helps you the most first of all, and then to the caregiver, how can you provide, continue to provide help at the current level? If not, why can't you? So it really asks the caregiver specific questions about their care needs. Again, nested within a larger assessment. Minnesota also has developed an assessment of a larger assessment. Again, two pages asked of the caregiver and uh, of a 38-page client assessment. Again, um, that's for Minnesota, and that is also on the caregiver website. Here's just a quick example of how after assessing someone, you could sort of figure out a way to then link them to services. So what we have, and maybe this should be re reversed, maybe the caregiver unmet needs should be on the left, but let's look at some of these unmet needs that you might find as a result of your assessment. You might find that a caregiver has high rates of depression or anxiety. In that case, the unmet need is some type of counseling. I say individual counseling, but it also might be useful to have the person that they're caring for as part of more family counseling. But that's something that then you would match to that available service. Second, let's say a caregiver scores low on the knowledge about their care recipient's diagnosis or chronic care condition. Then you would probably want to suggest to them that they think about an educational class or support group where they can learn more about the illness, more about the prognosis and what they might be expecting in the future. Third, you may have a caregiver note, even though you don't have specific question that she's stuck all stuck at home all day or she might rate high on a scale of care overload or feeling trapped in the caregiving role. And in that case you might think that in home respite might be useful for her. And in in home respite here could be broadly defined and broadly structured. It could be having someone come in the home, maybe a friendly visitor, to be with a care recipient while a caregiver does some type of activity. Now sadly but truly most caregivers when they get this time away from the care situation they don't go off and have a luxurious time going to a movie or even having dinner with friends, really getting away from it. What are they mostly doing? I'm sure many of you are nodding your head saying they are taking care of other caregiving duties that have been somehow left or left un undone. So it's really important that we acknowledge that with our families and make sure they really do something that can rejuvenate them. So they get those other things done maybe another time, but they can have a chance to really not feel trapped, not feel stuck at home all day. Let's say the next a caregiver rates high on needing help with household chores. You might indicate to them that they need some chore services brought in. And if the caregiver has barriers to self-care, they've stopped exercising, they're missing doctor's appointments, you might recommend or try to determine if they have a neighbor to walk with or even another family member to walk with just to take a quick walk. 
or to have someone, a daughter or a son, someone local to take them to the doctor. So in other ways, a friend too could take them to the doctor. But anyway, just by determining what these unmet needs are, then you can match them. But it's really important to do more than just sort of um, think about or um, really important just to really note these in a care plan. That way you can see in a few we, a few months when you do a reassessment, you could then say, well, look at, let's, let's look at what these goals you had. You had a goal of exercising more. How did that go? You can actually talk with them about what they've done. How about the in-home respite need? The plan was for you to, as a caregiver, have your daughter come in, take care of someone, or have a friendly visitor. Again, by having this written down in this type of form, you can really see what action steps have been made and therefore then ask them about the barriers to creating those action steps. Another issue, so moving away from the care plan then specifically, um, is using an assessment to create an effective care plan. So the best case scenario, because trying to connect the caregiver and the care recipient assessment, the best case, having the same assessment assess both caregiver and care recipient together and or separately. We found that it's very important to have each of them have some time separate from the other so that they can have a little bit of time to be maybe a little more open about some of their concerns, as well as together time. Now, sometimes families get a little um, distressed by thinking about, oh, they'll be talking, talking about me. But if you can do your best to, again, really go back to what the purpose of the assessment is, most families are very open to that. It's also important to try to share information across professionals and service settings if coordinated assessment is not possible. You know, it's a real good thing to have a coordinated assessment if you can, but that is not always a, poss a real possibility in our world. So it's important then to take those steps to make sure that other professionals are aware, make sure you get the release of information signed so that the, what the caregiver says can be passed on to other professionals and service providers. Do the best that you can to make it as coordinated even if they're not assessed together. And as I said before, effective assessment can definitely improve outcomes for both the caregiver and the care recipient. Okay, let's wrap up a little bit. I'm going to talk finally about what's going on in the future. Uh, a little bit about Texas. I believe there was a webinar recent, oh, not that recently, but not far long ago, that talked about what ha has gone on for the Texas reassessment. Uh, just briefly, in 2009, they had a Senate bill that made it important for the Department of Aging and Disability Services to have a caregiver support services need. And so, um, as I said, previous webinar talked about this, and you can look on the Family Caregiver Alliance website for that webinar. And that assessment definitely taps on the seven domains that I've talked about previously. But it's important just to notice that this is recent, not recent, but fairly recent legislation that has really made it important for the state of Texas to work with the Area Agency on Aging to really evaluate the needs of specific un, uh, informal caregivers in the state. So again, this is a three-page document with about three pages of directions. Excellent document, and uh, I can give you more information about that. As well, there's New Jersey. Um, and they have uh, created a assessment that is self-administered by the caregiver. Um, currently, as part of the pilot pro program for this a few years ago, um, the, the, there's now a final report out. It's New Jersey Care Partner Support Pilot Program, and uh, it talks a little bit about some of the outcomes that they found. But the seven pages, self-administered, looks at personal activities of daily living, the types of activities that the caregiver provides help with, the training needs, they actually say that. Would you like training for this? Would you like training for that? Also with troublesome behaviors, chronic health conditions, there's a burden scale. It's just an excellent example, a very thorough, purely caregiver support type of document. It does lead to an action plan, and it also helps to uh, get referrals to targeted services that might be helpful. There's phone logs, eight-page follow-up, self-administered other techniques, Again, a very good example, and, and you could pick and choose from some of those as well. And then lastly, I just want to draw attention to an activity that's being spearheaded by Family Caregiver Alliance with help from their colleagues at the AARP, Public Policy Institute at CMS, and Administration on Aging as well. It's the Home and Community-Based Services Advisory Panel. This is a panel that is made up of a few people who are working to create a national inventory of functional assessment instruments that are used within Medicaid, home, and community-based services. So they're collecting instruments through the state that actually help to identify key components, that will help to identify key components and best practices for including family caregivers and their needs within the functional assessment process. So a way of getting into 
a caregiver assessment a little bit through the back door through home-based community services. Hopefully in the next few months we'll be hearing more about that. But it's really to help caregivers, again, try to uh, get them assessed through the client who would then be the care recipient. Okay, so the selected assessment third then is the selected caregiver assessment measures. Um, right now our staff at Benjamin Rose and Joan Aging is working with Family Caregiver Alliance to develop the second edition of this caregiver assessment measures compendium. Um, and as I mentioned, where we see gaps in that compendium are in the medical procedures and information about diagnosis. We don't see a lot of measures there, but hopefully this will be coming out in the next few months um, as a 10-year follow-up to the one that was conducted in 2002. So that's where we are going to the future, and I just want to end then with a brief quote from Lynn Fris Feinberg, a formerly a Deputy Director of the National Center on Caregiving within Family Caregiver Alliance. Just to reiterate, the goal of assessment should be to help the person in need of care and the family providing the care to achieve the best possible quality of life in accordance with their values, as we talked about, needs, resources, and preferences. So again, I think that kind of summarizes what we've tried to do today, to really try to help them think about their resources, their strengths, et cetera, as well as making sure that their outcomes are either, as I said, maintained or improved or prevented from getting worse. So with that, I just want to draw attention to the end. We have a few references here. I want to thank everyone in the audience for attending, and I think I'll turn it over to questions for now. And Christina, as well, thank you so much for your excellent conversation. All right. Well, don't go away because we do have a lot of questions that have come in and they're still coming as we move through all this information. I'm going to keep things running for a while just to try and keep those uh, answering as many as we can get to. As I mentioned, there are hundreds of people attending today and I'm going to be forced to simply pick and choose some of the questions. So let's get right to it. We had a number of questions dealing with the idea of durable power of attorney. And that started with Dave asking, how about confidentiality concerns where the caregiver holds a DPOA? That's a good question. I think I understand the question. I think, Christina, you might be able to give some voice of experience from the field as well. So the confidentiality issue, I'm assuming, means that if someone has, if the client is the person with the chronic illness, if they have someone else having durable power of attorney, I'm assuming the question is if those choices are then confidential. So that means to me that if someone has a durable power um, over that person, that they would have the ability to make some decisions for them. But I'm not sure if that's the question. Maybe, Christina, you could add some light to that. For a lot of our clients, they, they may have power of attorney over the care recipient or they may not. Sometimes they've done that paperwork and sometimes they haven't. It's definitely an issue that we address. And if a caregiver says that no one has a power of attorney for the care recipient, if they're still at the, the point where they're able to make that decision, we'll advise them to do some legal planning and, and potentially give them some resources for that. Obviously, that depends on the care recipient, um, whether they have capacity, if there's a dementia diagnosis, um, you know, who they would want to be that person, but we're really there just to educate the caregiver on why that's important and where to go for that, that information. Um, in terms of confidentiality, our client is the caregiver, so we don't necessarily need the care recipient's permission. Um, it, we're getting our information directly from the caregiver. Um, so it's kind of what, what comes up for them, what are their issues, and so they may not have power of attorney, but they may be the one making the decisions. So we'll really advise them on what the options are um, in terms of power of attorney or just any other services as well. Uh, we definitely need the caregiver's permission if we're going to make a referral on their behalf, but then we would be sharing their information, say if we're going to refer them to an adult day program, we're referring the caregiver. Obviously, it would be for the care recipient, but we're not going to pass on the care recipient's information. We're passing on the caregiver's contact information as the person to follow up with. So I'm not sure if that answers that question. I think it does, but I want to extend it because Beth hit some of the same points with a specific case where the care recipient may have dementia leading to potential paranoia, suspicion, or anger at the caregiver. So how do you deal with those situations where the care recipient might be suspicious of professionals talking to the caregiver? Those are frequently times that we'll do the assessment outside of the home. Um, to not 
you know, further raise any other suspicions on the care recipient's behalf, um, but to also give the caregiver a space that they can talk openly. And then we'll try and do a lot of education around dementia. Are there ways to manage that, you know, changing communication styles? So we'll talk a lot about dementia and how do you manage those challenges that come up with, with dementia, whether that's paranoia and suspiciousness or, or anything else that might come up. So we'll frequently do those assessments outside of the home. I've done assessments where the care recipient's sitting there and there is some suspicion. It definitely changes the dynamic of the home visit because there's a lot of issues that we really just can't talk about then. You know, trying to include the care recipient in those conversations as much as possible, not wanting them to feel that like someone's talking about them or making decisions for them. Um, but the caregivers often then don't feel as comfortable talking about certain issues or their experience of them. So if we do it in the home and the care recipient is there and they tend to be very suspicious or paranoid, we may end up needing to do further assessments um, either by phone or in another location. Okay, this is an issue that's uh, getting a lot of interest. I'm seeing a, a number of questions that go into more specifics. This tells us that maybe we should look at giving a webinar specifically on this topic. So I'm going to hold some of those for later and move on to some other areas to try and get more in. Um, getting very specific, Becky asked you, Christina, do you have specific tools that help you assess depression that you can recommend? We do have a depression screen. Um, it's it's called the CESD. Um, unfortunately, I can't remember the full name of it. It is part of the the toolkit that's on our website, so I know it is up there. Um, so we do use that screening. It's a Likert screen. It's a self-administered. Sometimes we'll do it with the caregiver during the assessment. Sometimes we'll send it out to them ahead of time, and so they have it already filled out when we get there. Um, and that really is kind of a personal style of each family consultant, how they choose to do it. So it, it addresses such issues of, you know, their sleep and their appetite. Um, you know, do they have activities that they enjoy, kind of pleasure and activities, their energy levels, so kind of all those main domains of depression. Um, so we have an actual tool. I know a number of people also will use the geriatric depression screen. Um, in other settings, that one is frequently used. Not all of our clients are seniors. Some of them as caregivers are younger, so we tend to use this broader depression screen. And then a lot of it is also, again, just the clinical training. So it's great to have that form, and we can get a number out of it. Um, but if they score 17 or above, that, that's a sign for depression. But then it's also also just using our own clinical judgment uh, based on our conversation, does it seem like depression is an area that they're going to need more help with? And then that will come into the care plan afterwards of kind of what the resources and options are for them. Can, can I jump in for a moment? Please do. I wanted to draw the attention of the listener to the last page of the overhead that says Family Caregiver Alliance expected 2012. We are putting out a compendium of selected caregiver assessment measures, and these include a huge section on depression, uh, as well as other domains that we've talked about, seven domains. So that's a really good place for listeners to go to. Um, the current one of 2002, we're expecting the one that we're now working on to be done in a couple of months. So if they can hold off for a couple of months, otherwise go back to the previous one. Really good examples of measures in that document. Excellent. Thank you for that resource. And while we're talking about resources, Christina, you have a lot of people that want to know how your organization works. And I have questions all over the place on specifics, such as how do you reimburse your family consultants? Where do you find the funds and the availability for highly skilled interpreters you were talking about? Do you have any statistics on how your services are working for your caregivers? Uh, what can you help tell us about some of those or where we can find more information? Sure. So Family Caregiver Alliance, we have a number of different funding sources. We do have the National Center on Caregiving, and they have separate funding sources. But at the Caregiver Resource Center levels, the direct services, we get some money from the state of California um, to provide services for family caregivers. That's the money that's always in question um, and that we frequently then have to adapt our services because of cuts. We also, in many counties, and this is true for all the caregiver resource centers throughout the state, are a contract agency for the counties 
um, with the federal money that they get from the National Family Caregiver Support Program. So federal money that comes down to the states through the counties, and then we are a contract agency for the counties to provide those services. And that's where the kind of the bulk of our, our funding comes from to do assessments and um, there's other services as well that we're contracted with and that includes education and classes and sometimes respite. In terms of interpreters, um, we generally don't have the funding to be paying for interpreters. We usually have built up relationships within different communities. So I mentioned the Afghani community. I work a lot with a case manager um, from an organization, Jewish Family and Children's Services, and they have specifically an Afghani Farsi speaking case manager there. And so she provides interpreters and she really is the link to that community for us. Um, so we just had to develop those networks to have interpreters that way. And so again, that's where it's important to have interpreters who really, again, not just fluent, but understand how to interpret. And that's not always something that we've had. Um, there's definitely home visits that I've gone out on where they're fluent in the language and they're from that particular community, but it's not always the ideal interpreting situation. Um, so again, there's what the ideal is and then what you work with as a nonprofit. We have in the past, again, when we've had more money from the state, been able to do kind of more research on comparing assessment data and reassessment data, comparing depression scores over time. Um, right now, we do have surveys that we send out to caregivers, so they're more satisfaction surveys. Um, we do those for anyone who's received a service from us over the course of the last year. So that's kind of where we get our, how effective is our services. I'm going to have to get one more little say in there on this one, is that the Family Caregiver Alliance has a number of peer-reviewed publications that actually document some of their successes. So you know, that's something we could somehow draw the listener to as well. Okay, great. And let's see, while we were talking about different languages, uh, Huajuan wanted to know if you make available your translated Chinese or Spanish assessments. And I think that one goes back to Christina again. I, you know, I would have to double check. I believe we do because it is our same assessment form that is on our website. It's the, you know, our full assessment that's up there as part of that Caregivers Count 2 toolkit. So the translated version should be on there. That's something we can get back and let them know for sure. But right. again, it's Let's the same see. toolkit that that's <laughs> available on our website in public. Okay, so we keep coming back to do check that toolkit on the website. It's your number yeah. one resource. And I, I just looked up and, and yes, we do have it on our, our website in the other languages. Fantastic. Okay, let's see what else uh, came in here. Anita asked, uh, you mentioned at one point, don't be shy to talk about abuse and neglect. What, what do you mean? Uh, share a little more about how you would go about that since these can be very difficult areas. There's, there are specific ways just to tap into it briefly. Have you ever, you know, questions, and Christina, you might have specific questions that you've used, but questions that have you uh, and you can see in some of the assessments that we've referred to again in the toolkit, have you ever been afraid to have some certain person come into your home? So that sort of starts the conversation going. And those are actual questions that, that some of these assessment tools ask. Or is there someone you're afraid of who makes you nervous about them coming into your home? And that's asked of the care recipient. Um, I haven't seen many caregivers ask that question, but that could be adapted for caregivers as well. Um, and mainly, I haven't seen any caregivers because there are fewer assessment tools specifically for caregivers, but I haven't seen much of that. But to start the conversation with that of fearfulness, or you could even ask directly, has anyone taken advantage of you financially? Um, that's another way to look at it. Or have you been hurt recently by someone? Those are the ways to start that conversation going. Christina, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, we don't have, um, as part of our assessment tool, there aren't any specific questions about that. And again, we are talking to the caregiver and not the care recipient, so the questions are going to be a little different. It definitely comes up. Sometimes the caregivers bring it up because there has been abuse by either another family member or financial abuse by some outside party. So it's not uncommon for us to make referrals to Adult Protective Services and to make those reports. In terms of talking about it with the family, we have had situations that have come up where there may be actions that are questionable and we'll address those directly with the caregiver. Sometimes it's a lack of education, of understanding what's okay and what's not okay in terms of their behavior, and so we'll address that directly. If we need to make a report of those situations to Adult Protective Services, we'll usually talk with the family about that and let them know. 
So again, it's more of a clinical screening as opposed to us having specific questions, but it's using that judgment of are there red flags being raised? And we'll try and talk about it directly with the families, whether it's something that's going on with, within themselves or, or their actions or an outside person. I'm sorry, I found myself on mute when I didn't expect to be. <laughs> Let's look at a question from Jennifer who asks, are there different assessment measures you would use when dealing with younger, non-elderly caregivers? That's such a good question. So the compendium that we, that we are revising has measures included in it that are not caregiver specific, so that's a part of that. But yes, I think a lot of these are appropriate for non-elderly families and caregivers as well. And or for someone who's not taken care of a person who's elder or who has some kind of a chronic condition more common in the elderly. So I think these measures don't have to be specifically made for that population that, that the question is referencing, then they are applicable to that population. And so again, I would refer everyone to that list of assessment measures that's coming out. Fantastic. And we are running at or beyond the point where we talked about uh, going in this session, but we wanted to make sure and get as much information out there as possible. I think at this point I'm going to store up the remaining questions in our log and we'll make sure to address those either online or in a future web seminar to get you the information that you're asking about. That's a wonderful way to let us know what topics are of interest to you. Thank you so much for attending and I would like to thank certainly the Family Caregiver Alliance, but also our two speakers today, Carol Whitlatch and Christina Irving. And thank you to you for attending and spending your time with us.